I want to get us used to how we read the Bible. It's always, matter of fact, not always, but there are times where it's really easy for us to listen to what someone says and just scratch our heads like, what, huh? How did you get that? It's easy in some cases to point out where someone is eisegeting a passage, where someone is inserting something or in many cases, in or like today, inserting themselves, making themselves to be who the passage is talking about. There are passages in the Bible that have nothing to do with us. There are passages that have nothing to do with us that we can get a secondary application from. There's only one interpretation, but there can be different applications. That part we understand, but sometimes where there is no application, we try to apply ourselves. We want ourselves to be something because we think we're special. Not all of us, but some of us do. And Paul says not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. That shows up when we're talking about Israel. Who is Israel? You can hear some of these people say some things like, that is not what the passage says. It's not what it means. You are not, you are, you are reading too much into the passage or you're inserting yourself into the passage. And so we're going to see that you have seen different people from different camps of the Hebrew Israelites who will call themselves the, the original Jews or the, that they are Jews. They are Israel. And when you listen to them break down scripture, you're puzzled. Because if you listen to them long enough, you might start thinking, is it just me or is something wrong with me? No, nope, nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with your television set. Nothing wrong with your radio. You don't have to adjust anything. They are saying something foolishly. And so it's up to us, especially if we're going to be, as we would say, Bereans. If we're going to be good students of the scriptures, go back and look and see what they're saying. But listen to what this particular person says who, guys... There is no theological respect that I have for this man whatsoever. I'm not saying anything personal. I don't know anything about the man personal. He does seem to, to like this, this uh, grandiose style of his. He does like to be presented in a in a in a night. Remember, this is the guy that came in on the horse, dresses a certain way, regally as though he's the king, and they treat him this way. And it's like, wow, okay, you people are amazing. These are the very same folks that said, hey, you all are worshiping this. This white Jesus, well, listen, you worshiping this black police officer, former police officer, you're worshiping him. But that's not necessarily the point. But when he speaks, there is not a there is not a theological bone in him. Understanding that black people, our people that came from Africa and that are currently in Africa, we are part of the 12 tribes of Israel written of in the Bible. A lot of people don't realize that when they read about Moses, and the Israelites, that was on the continent of Africa. Holy Bible. Now, you got to ask the question, what makes you think that all of those people had the same skin hue? Because it is a fact that everybody in Africa, on Africa, not just today, but even then did not have the same skin hue. We just, there are varieties in skin. There had to be a way, a reason, some sort of way that people looked or, or, or developed different skin tones, different hair textures and so forth. That didn't just happen. Well, that's obviously a byproduct of God. And so we saw that in Africa, but, but this guy is, listen, talk about loser theology. This is, this is, this is without question loser theology, but I'm going somewhere with this guy. So let's not, don't think it's going to be just about him, but listen to some more of what he's saying. And now I need y'all to write this stuff down. Okay. Deuteronomy 28, watch what God told Moses to tell us. This was, again, on the continent of Africa. This is what he said. All these curses will come upon you. Now, He's speaking to who? I understand what he's saying. He's saying that he's speaking to, these are black folk, these are Africans, because it happens to be in North, well, okay, fine, fine. Technically, you're correct. He's speaking to Africans because they are on the continent of Africa, but one, they don't see themselves as Africans, at least the way that he sees themselves, and they don't see themselves as black men. 
were there some dark skinned people there? Sure. Were there some lighter skinned people there? Yeah. Were there some those that are in between? Yeah. You know why? Because God created them. And so we it, it it'd be no no stretch, no surprise to find different colors of people there. But the point that he's making, and this is what I would ask you guys, especially those of you who have been coming to the Bible study on Saturdays, Deuteronomy is speaking about who when is this when is this taking place? This is taking place as Moses has given the law. And in given the law, what do we have? Remember, let's put some on the screen for you guys to see. Uh, we have the book of Exodus. Exodus happens to be the book of the law. Moses is bringing them out of Egypt. And then it's one of the chronological books. But the complementary books to Exodus happens to be, as we see below it, Leviticus and Deuteronomy. So in the book, he's giving an explanation, description, more detail in Deuteronomy as well as Leviticus about the law, different things they can do, can't do, should do, should not do. If you break this, if you violate this, what's going to happen? The Jews or Israel is going to be taken out of the land. They're going to be punished and they're going to be punished severely. We'll talk about this issue about being taken out of the land in just a little bit because it's going to be necessary that we cover that. But to think this is just about black folks is just utterly ridiculous. Utterly ridiculous. But again, Theological is not the name of this man's game. So, if, if I have hatred towards someone, I right. can say that my heart is black. It's not uh, physically black. Mm, okay. But light and darkness is quite contrast between good and evil, etc. Like that. It has mm. nothing to do with people, people's skin tones. Now, he's having a conversation with this white gentleman, and the man is trying to say that what he's speaking of has nothing to do with someone's skin tone. This man because he sees a color spoken of in the Bible, he, he pounces on it. Job was a black man. This is almost like when you saw, when you when you would, anybody watch Saturday Night Live back in the day, and there was a guy on there, I think Chris Rock was got to play Nat X, and he would say just any and everybody was a black man. Captain Crunch was a black man, but you wouldn't know this. Or he said, yeah, Santa Claus was a black man. All the Everybody was a black man. That's the foolishness that we're getting out of here. Why? Because what he's doing is he's reading himself into the text. More than classic eisegesis, this is just out of this world eisegesis because it's really narcissegesis. This is you wanting to be part. And so he sees or hears someone speaking about a color, namely black. And so because Job makes a statement about black, then Job must be black. So what about this? Job chapter 30 verse 30. My skin is black upon me, and my bones are burned with heat. So that's not skin? I don't know this particular word and what it references, but I can tell you this, is that it's not referring to... Just as I said, your heart is black. But what about his skin? Can I not say that my heart is black? Now, this is where... And I don't want to be mean, but I have to be. This is where the ignorance of this man just exudes. Let's go to Job 30, 30. And it says, my skin, now some of your versions may say it like this, my skin turns black. Now, if you notice, look at look at my cursor for a second. Notice when I when I move the cursor to skin, you see the word skin uh, highlighted on, in the, on the left side in the English and then on the right side in Hebrew. You see it or you see that highlighted. But then if I move it over to turns, it's highlighted. And if, and if I move it over to the word black, the, it doesn't move on the right side. Why is that? Well, because the word black uh, in this case is the word shakar and the word turns, and there is a Hebrew word for turn, but it's not here. So why is it highlighted? Why does it say, why does it say turn black? Because this is the call perfect, which says that it has turned black. My skin has turned black. In other words, if this man even bothered to just read, he would see that Job's skin turned black. More importantly, the color of his skin is not a highlight in Job's life right here. Job is going through something. So the blackness of his skin is not something to be highlighted. Man, I'm so glad my skin turned black because at this point, at this moment, y'all, hey, black is beautiful. No, Job is not feeling like black is beautiful right now. This is because Job is, is, is being hit, smitten, struck hard. And he says, my bones burn with fever. Is this man also going to say that Job that Job's bones are on fire? So 
this is the foolishness, this is the nonsense that we get from them. But I say the best way to avoid these kind of things is just to read the Bible. Now, you all know me. I have what I have. I haven't coined this phrase. I've, I've adopted this because as I've looked and seen how people read the Bible, I've adopted, you've heard me say this before, a literal grammatical historical hermeneutic. Guys, I don't care what anyone says. I don't care if those folks who disagree with my hermeneutics would would, would get, get together a team and say, Corey, that's just your hermeneutics. Well, okay, what is yours? And I can promise you that your hermeneutic is not the same hermeneutic that it is with everything else. Matter of fact, my hermeneutic is your hermeneutic for 99.9% .9 of everything that you read, including the Bible. My hermeneutics is your, is your hermeneutics when you're reading a menu. My hermeneutic is your hermeneutics when you're reading a menu, when you're reading directions, when you're reading uh, a map, when you're reading most of the Bible. It's just consistent. Now, we're going to see how that is the case. And you're going to find out that some of these people, I love them to death. I love them to death. But you're going to have to make a better point, a better case as to why you make some of these statements. Now, if we're going to harp on this brother, and by the way, they are in no way, shape, form, or fashion, no way, shape, form, or fashion in the same camp as a Hebrew Israelite. Nowhere. Uh, these are solid brothers in Christ. And so I want you to please, to please listen to what is being said. And you tell me, does this require scrutiny? I'm sorry, I'm trying to move this thing over because the moderator said to put this on slow mode. And so because I have the best moderators on the planet, what must I do? Put it on slow mode. And I know there's going to be someone, as soon as I put it on slow mode, they're going to, they're going to be upset. But there it is. Now we're on slow mode. But I want you all to listen to this. <laughs> Shiny River says slow mode. No. But I want you all to listen to this, and then you all tell me, because the point is, the question is this, and I've asked you guys this question in, in, the, in the chats, not the chats, but the, uh, the little poll. The question is, and let, matter of fact, let me just see how you guys have responded. My question is, who is true Israel? Now, I could have put more selections, but YouTube only gives us four selections, so I just went with four. The last one has to be, I don't know. So, who is true Israel? The church is Israel. 26% said so. Anyone with Jewish blood or ethnic, ethnic uh, Israel, ethnic Jew, that's who Israel is, 47%. Those who are in Israel now, 5%. Uh, I don't know, 22%. Now, there could have been another one. There's probably a better one to go with. Matter of fact, the actual answer, I'm sorry, guys, I apologize, but the actual answer is not up there. <laughs> Forgive me. But that being the case, let's hear what who Bodhi Bakum says is true Israel. Do I think we ought to hate Israel? No. Do I think we ought to love them because they're Israel? No. Because I believe that the church is the true, real, new Israel, Jew and Gentile alike. And that those people over there in that piece of land over there, they don't have eschatological significance to me. Now, back up just a second. Well, I just I want to just kind of put a, a bow over the, the whole issue of color. Because I need because some people are going to come in who are Hebrew Israelites and they saw that that the Hebrew Israelite brother is on the on the on the cover. And you're going to hear me saying that and I don't mind saying that that he's an, that he is a biblical idiot. Have no problem saying it. Not a put down. It's a fact. That being the case. I want you all to get something through if you're thinking this. The color of uh, who we're speaking of doesn't matter. Why? Because God made every single color on the planet. Whatever color you are, you are not, you are not inferior or superior to the next person because God is the one who made you, whatever color you are. Now, if we want to talk about who has done atrocities and start comparing who's the greatest or who's the worst, the fact of the matter is, it's a dead heat. It's a tie between blacks, whites, Hispanics, Asians, you name it. You name it. You pick a country, you pick a continent, you pick a place where people who have tread on it did not commit every sort of atrocity. You pick the ethnicity. You pick their group. Native Americans, they're pure. No, they were the last folks in America to have slaves. They're not so pure. The greatest slave traders in the, on the planet were, were some of the, I shouldn't say the greatest, were some of the most egregious slave traders most ruthless 
were those in the Middle East, Muslims. What about the folks in South America? What about white folks in general? What about black folks in general? You think about, listen, not one black person came to America free. Yeah, they didn't start off on the boat free. They got on the boat as slaves under other Africans. And so there's enough, there's enough, um, uh, what's the word? There's, there's enough ugly to go around and it impugns every single race. That's the human race. There's only one color that matters. That is red. That's why I say red lives matter. If your life is not marked by the blood, you're going to hell. No way to even put it, make it nicely. But if you're, if you're not marked by the blood, if your debt hadn't been paid by that blood, you're going to hell. Black, white, Hispanic, whatever. Big mouth, small mouth, deaf, mute, doesn't matter. If you do not, if you're not covered by the blood, you are going to hell. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm not going to push the button. It's not my mic drop moment. But he makes a statement, voted us, and he says that Israel is, or the church is the new Israel. The true, the real, the new Israel. I don't have a problem with that statement whatsoever. I don't have a problem with the statement. Wait a minute, Corey. You don't have a problem with that statement? Nope. I do not have a problem with that statement. And I know what's supposed to say. Well, I, wait, wait a second. 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 Corey, I've heard you before. I know you got a problem with that statement. No, I do not have a problem with that statement. No, I don't. I have a problem with the fact that there's no Bible to back up the statement. If you can find, I listen, I'm shutting this bad boy down. And my wife says, stop doing that, Corey. But if you can find the verse, find the verse or verse. If you got a, if you got to string together some verses that says that that the church is the new Israel, please let me know. Please help me to know. But wait a second, Corey. Did not God Almighty did he not divorce Israel? I don't know. Did he? Did he not divorce Israel? Now here's my point before I go into it. Because let's just keep it consistent. My issue with, and, I, and listen, I love Vody Bakum. I, I promise you I do. I promise you I do. I met him and known him before you all did. I, listen, now are we bosom buddies? No, no, he wouldn't know me if, he, if, if I crossed in front of him. But I know his family. The point is this, though. If we're going to hold other people's hermeneutics up to scrutiny, then his as well as mine also. This is why I share with you how I read the Bible, how I'm looking at things. But the issue is he, good, solid brother and others. But if you hold a theological system up and then read the text in light of the system, this is what you come up with. This is what you come up with. There is no scripture in the Bible to back up the claim that the church has replaced Israel. But wait a minute, Corey. Are you saying that there are two different people, two different paths? I'm saying however many people that there are in the Bible or are many in the body, let's just say, let, follow me, track for me a second, then we'll go to the scriptures. But let's just say, I don't know, there will be 10 million Christians, 10 million people in heaven. 10 million people. All 10 million went different routes to get to where they got. Now, they all entered by Christ. There's only The only way for salvation is faith in God. That's the only way for us placing our faith in Christ. That is the only way. And what we have throughout the Bible, guys, I need you all to hear this. Because if we read it, we're going to find that there, the, the Bible chronicles the lives of a lot of people, some who are Jewish, some who are not, who are faithful in the Lord. Job was not a Jew, but his life is chronicled, right? Abel was not a Jew, but his life is chronicled. How, how he, how he, how he found his name in the in Hebrews eleven, the Faith Hall of Fame. Then, you'll see it's different than let's say how Abraham did. You'll see it's different than let's say how Rahab did. Are you with me? What we have in the Bible is a chronicling of Israel as a nation being brought before God, their sin, their fall, their disobedience, but also their promise from God to what he's going to do with them. Because they're highlighted 
uh, predominantly in the scriptures, doesn't mean that God doesn't have a care or a promise for you. Does not mean that he doesn't have a, a purpose for you. And I think that's part of the problem. We want to see ourselves just like the Israelites want to see themselves as someone special. So too do a lot of us good Christian folk. A lot of reform, and, and I'm, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be mean, guys, but reform people, this is you. This is you. Uh, you if a person is a Calvinist, but does not believe that it doesn't hold to this covenant theology, then you can't be reformed. Reform necessarily requires that you have to believe, hold to this covenant, covenantal theology. Um, I'll get to that uh, for ALC. I'll get to that in just a little bit if you want me to. As long as as long as long it's in regard to what I'm speaking of. So I'll, I'll get to it. I've got you marked. So the question is, does the church become Israel or is Israel Israel? Now, I do not believe nor should anyone believe that every single Jew, every single person, Jewish person that resides in Israel is who God is speaking of. No, they all will not be saved. Okay? So I don't want, I, I, I'll do our very best to not to straw man any person's position. But if you think that you have become a spiritual Israel, one, that's not true. But two, take all of what Israel has coming then. Take everything of what Israel has coming, which is going to be the punishment. Now, that being the case, someone will say, well, 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 Israel was divorced. Israel was divorced. And so let's go to where they go to Jeremiah 3. And by the way, we need to remember what Jeremiah, the whole book of Jeremiah. Let, let me put it back on the screen because I want you guys to see. Jeremiah is a prophet to who? He's a prophet to the southern nation. Okay, that's important because Jeremiah is going to speak about this, nor I mean, to the northern kingdom. He's going to speak about the northern kingdom um, in a por portion of his prophecy, but he's going to speak about Israel as a whole, the north and the south, and see what happens, what he's speaking of. So that it, it, it's important to keep in mind when Jeremiah was written, what was happening, and the point of his letter. So let's go to Jeremiah 3. Let's start in verse 6. Then the Lord said to me, in the days of Josiah the king, have you seen what faithless Israel did? He's speaking of the northern kingdom. Have you seen what faithless Israel have as did, have, have, what they did? She went up on every high hill and under every green tree, and she was a harlot there. I thought after she has done all these things, she will return to me, but she did not return. And her treacherous sister, Judah saw it. So now notice the Lord is talking about also his treacherous sister, Judah. Judah is the southern kingdom. Israel is the northern kingdom. They're all, they all make up Israel. All 12 tribes are in the north and the south. Okay. Verse, verse eight. And I saw that for all the adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away uh, and given her a writ of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but she went and was a was a harlot also. So Judah was worse than Israel. Now this issue about giving them a bill of divorce. Hey, listen, bye, see, see ya. But does God does does God separate Himself from Israel? There's a question. Before we continue, guys in the chats, does God separate Himself from Israel? That's the question, because some people that will read that will read it and then just stop. Same thing with John 15. They'll read portion of it and then just stop. Well, no, keep reading it. Keep reading it if you think that whoever he's speaking to has to keep bearing fruit and keep remaining in order to be saved. But you keep reading. He says that I have appointed you in order that you will do so. So does he separate? Does he does, does he separate himself from Israel? No, let's continue reading. Because of the lightness of her harlotry, she polluted the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. Yet in spite of all this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with all her heart, but rather in deception declares the Lord. Look what he says, though. And the Lord said to me, faithless Israel has provoked herself. I mean, I'm sorry, proved herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. But wait a second. I thought you gave her a divorce. Read what's happening. If she was the worst one, you divorced her. Not that, no, that's not what's happening, guys. God, he says, go and proclaim these words towards the, toward the north and say, return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not, look what he says, I will not look upon you in anger, for I am gracious, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. 
only acknowledge your iniquity. This is important, guys. Only acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against the Lord your God and have scattered your favors to the strangers under every green tree and you have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. So he says, acknowledge your iniquity. Well, why is that important? Why is that important? Because there's a prophecy, by the way, will they do it? Yes and no. No, well, yes, not not really. <laughs> no, they will. I mean, no, they will not do, but yes, they will. Yes, they will. God is going to do something first. Now, what is happening in Jeremiah? What are they getting ready to do? Jeremiah is telling him, hey, you all are getting put out of the land. God has spent all this time dealing with Israel, and he's getting ready to put them out of the land, only to bring them back. I'll hold off on that for a second. But I want to play something else that uh, that Vody says, and he's just he's listen. I'm sorry, love Vody to death. Love Vody. Let me just say it again, so someone doesn't say Corey you just hating Vody. No, love Vody Bakken. I do, I do. But he's just wrong on this, especially this area here. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. What's being referred to here? Who are your people? Your people are the people of God. Daniel's people are the people of God. There are some people who are ethnic Jews with him in Babylon who are less his people than you and I are if we're in Christ. Okay. He's talking about, in, and we'll go to Daniel 12, but about what he's speaking of, he says that who, who are Daniel's people? He's saying that there are people that were there that are less Daniel's people than some of us who are here. That's not true. We're not talking about Daniel's people. We're talking about what he's conflating the two, Daniel's people and God's people. God's people are made up of a lot of different people, a lot of different ethnicities. That's different than what Daniel is praying about. Why do I know so well? Because we're going to look at what Daniel is actually praying and who he's praying for and what's the whole point of Daniel 12 as well as the previous uh, three chapters, 9, 10, and 11. We're going to come to that in just a little bit, but let's listen to Vody some more. Here's Daniel with other ethnic Jews. And there are some of those about whom this statement is true. You and I, who are not ethnic Jews, are more his people than those who were with him in Babylon at that time. Why? We'll be more or more of God's people than they are but we're not more of Daniel's people. Now, I want to ask you guys this question. When we read the Bible, I know it's it's easy to, to, to kind of put ourselves there and think about how this relates to us. What do we think he's meaning? What, what do we think he means here? But I asked yourself this question. What do you think when the Jews hear this? What do you think? How do you think they understood it? But even more to the point, because you're going to say, well, some of these Jews, some of these Jews, they weren't godly people, so they don't know. Who, who cares what they thought? Who cares how they understood it? That's fine. How do you think Daniel, who is clearly under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, because we have his writings for to bear his name, how do you think Daniel understood what he was saying? Do you think that Daniel was thinking of someone other than ethnic Israel? Do you think that Daniel had in mind when that, because remember, now Daniel knows who's he, who he's praying to, who he's praying about. Daniel is praying for his people, Israel. That's who he's praying for. Daniel is not praying for the whole world. He's praying for his people. Why? Remember, he's been in prayer. And this is the, this is the prayer that he prayed. And then 21 days later, the angel shows up and says that, hey, I've been fighting on my way. We, we, the answer was dispatched as soon as you prayed. But the prince of Persia got in my way. There was a battle and so forth. And so here I am. Daniel is praying about his people. I asked you about this issue about iniquities and so forth. If they just get, if they just acknowledge their iniquity and so forth. Well, Daniel just gave a prophecy in Daniel nine. This prophecy is all is only about Israel. This seven week prophecy is only about Israel because he said so. <laughs> if we just read the, it, it literally speaks of Israel. And it talks about dealing with iniquity and and bringing in everlasting righteousness to who? To Israel. And so Daniel here in 12 is not speaking of 
the world, his people, Daniel's people that he's referring to is Israel. Daniel know who knows who he's, who, he's, who he's praying about. Daniel knows who he's asking in regards to his people. But then the response is probably not necessarily what Daniel's looking for, but his people were Israel. That part cannot be missed. You have to literally read into it. You've got to take your doctrine, your theology, and read it into it. Daniel was clearly praying about Israel. Is that a bad thing? Because an Israelite prayed about Israel? Is that a bad thing? No. Should we be bothered because an Israelite prayed about Israel? No. We're getting to see what God is doing to them because of their disobedience. Remember, God says, we read this uh, the other day, how God stated that you were supposed to go into this land and what you did not do, this is Deuteronomy 33 or 34, I can't remember. And because you, because if you do not drive them out, these inhabitants, I will drive you out. And what I was going to do to them, I'll do to you. He's speaking to Israel. How come us Gentiles aren't jumping up and claiming that prophecy? How can we, we, listen, we are quick to jump up and take the blessings. And then there are some who said that we'll, we'll, we'll take the punishment as long as we can say that we are in the millennium right now, the greatest, I mean, in, yeah, in the millennium right now or in the tribulation, greatest tribulation ever in the history of mankind. Yeah, well, our, our tribulation is so great. We've got Wi-Fi, we've got ice cream, air conditioning. We got That's how great our tribulation is. Even though, even though Jesus said it's going to be worse than anything we've ever seen, nothing like it. Yeah, but have you gone to other countries, though, Corey? You mean so all you got to do to escape the tribulation is just to leave North Korea, leave China, uh, leave Azerbaijan, leave, leave whatever, come here to America? There's no tribulation. Does that even make sense? No, it doesn't make sense. The tribulation will be felt in mass over the entire globe. So he's clearly praying for and about Israel. Again, this is a man who is writing under the inspiration and is getting prophecies from the Lord. He is writing and speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so he knows who he's speaking of. Why? Because if they were not gods by faith, if they did not belong to God by faith, they weren't really Daniel's people at all. But you and I who belong to him by faith are Daniel's people. And so again, you're, you're, you're conflating the two. Daniel's people and God's people Two different things. Two different things. And I don't know why. I, I know why. I know why. There's just this, this run, this push. And it's because of maybe a particular profession, profession or confession that will have us. We've got to hold to this. Got to hold to this, to this view. This has to fit. By the way, the whole, <laughs> uh, some of you guys with the, with the, um, uh, theonomy, theonomist, uh, right now it ain't looking too good. It's not looking too good. I don't want to get to the end time stuff, but it ain't looking too good for this whole uh, move towards theonomy. But anyway, back to this. So Michael is not just in this picture. When you read it and flesh it out, there is this coming for the people of God. This is not just coming for Israel. Yeah, it's coming for the Israel of God, the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. But this is not just about one particular ethnic and geopolitical people group. But isn't this what we read in Romans chapter 9, verses 16 to 13? Now, we'll get to Romans 9, but when he says it's not about a, an ethnic, um, geographically centered, what have you, people group, yes, it is. It, it, it literally is. It literally is. What was, let me just, you know what, let me go there. Let's go to the passage. This is what started the whole thing off. This is the passage that started off. And you all should even know where I'm going. This is the passage that started it off. To say it's not about a certain people group or an, ethni an ethnicity or a geographic location. Yes, it is. The prophecy that governs, I'm sorry, not the prophecy, the covenant that governs us as well as Jews is this Abrahamic covenant. This is the beginning. It's not the beginning, obviously. But notice what's stated in Genesis 12. He tells him, get out of his country. I'm taking to a land that I will show you. And look what he says. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So there's a differentiation between a differentiation between Abraham's people and all the other families of the earth that will be, be that will be blessed because of Abraham and, and his descendants. 
And this necessarily brings up land. We know so because when Abraham is going to be talked to, spoken of this land, the boundaries of this land, is God just marking out territory just because? Some of you guys have done this before. I've done it where you didn't really have a lot of money and you went just driving in nice neighborhoods, just hoping and wishing that I'd love to have a house like that. Love to have a lot like that. Well, that's not what God is doing. God is telling Abraham, telling Isaac, telling Jacob, telling Moses, telling Joshua, this is the land that I'm giving to you. It's yours. And he gives them the boundaries. Question, has Israel ever occupied all of the land that God promised them? All of the land boundaries that Israel was promised by God. I don't care if you think it's spiritual Israel or national or physical Israel. Have they ever occupied that land? The answer is no, they have never. Well, what, what's up, God? Were you just making something up? Were you just wailing? What, what, what's the word capping? Is it, did I say the right capping? No, he's God. He didn't, have, he didn't have to make up anything. He intends to, to fulfill everything that he said. Every other promise that we can think of has been fulfilled and been fulfilled, has been fulfilled physically and literally. All we're waiting on are those regarding his second coming. Amen. So now he's dealing with Israel. Again, it's not a knock against us. Sometimes we think because, well, they didn't mention my name. They didn't mention my, I think some people would much rather have their, their a, a name on the board for employee of the month versus being the person who never gets employee of the month, but they make the most money in the company. Some of you guys would, would forsake the most money in the company or a, a, an increase in salary just to get your name on a little placard that says employee of the month just because I've, I, I've just got to have somebody to recognize me. This isn't about, it's not always about you. You think that, that you, I tell you what, you get you a bunch of your people, a bunch of Gentile folks, and go find a common enemy. Go find a Planned Parenthood. Do that. Walk around it six every day. And then on the seventh day, walk around and shout. See what happens. For first of all, the cops are coming. That's number one. But number two, you can apply some of these things. It is about what God is doing with them. And he's showing us that these people, that's why Paul writes in Romans, that they, that they were written for our understanding. We can learn these things. See what happens when you disobey God. See what happens when you trust in God. See what happens when you walk by yourself. See what happens when you walk with God. But also you can see the character of God, how he stated that he loves you. And even in spite of your sin, of your foolishness, your stupidity, that he is still a loving, merciful God that will want to bring you back. Amen. And that, now that's all of our testimony, some way, shape, or fashion, whether we be Jewish, whether we be um, uh, Gentile or not. Oh, by the way, you ever notice how there's always a, 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 a distinction between in the New Testament, especially with Paul, with Jew and Gentile, Jew and Gentile to the Jew first and then to the Gentile or Jew first and then to the Greek. There's a reason for that. There's something that, that God is trying to do. Now, he makes this statement, and, and he's not the only one. He's not the only one. But that's a big mistake to say that 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 plot of land over there has no eschatological view. Well, first of all, how do you open your mouth to say that when Revelation is speaking a whole lot about Israel, a whole lot about Jerusalem, and so do these prophecies about the end time and really about where he wants Israel to be, to take them out of the land, to bring them back into the land? What land? Not America. Not Africa not China, to bring Israel back into their land. He is going to do so. At, well, actually, he's done so. And then what is he going to do sometime in the future? He's going to do something to their heart. But now, he's not the only one. And this is low-hanging fruit. I, I, I get I get it because I actually covered this before. It's low-hanging fruit, but I just want you to know that he's not the only one. But how he's saying this is just like others when they make these statements. This is Joel Webin, who I do I do love as a brother, but I think he's dead wrong on this. And the lack of scripture is just is just amazing. But I want you to hear what he says. There is this view that if you take Israel and say that the church is Israel, the church is the new Israel, church is the spiritual Israel, that if you do so, then it's called you. Someone would call it replacement theology. And people who hold to this view that the church is the new Israel, 
they would believe that replacement theology is a put down. Now, let me just explain something before I go forward. The church and Israel are distinct. How so, Corey? Well, the church is made up of believers. Anyone who is a believer, Jew or Gentile. The mere fact that we even say Jew or Gentile indicates that there's a distinction between Jew and Gentile. But the church is made up of anybody, whoever the believing one is, whether you're old, young, black, white, Hispanic, what have you, if you are a believing person, if you place your faith in Christ, you are part of the church. The church literally means the assembly, the congregation, God's people. And so if you are his, you are part of this body, Jew or Gentile. You don't get to become Israel. Israel is something distinct. Is Israel better than the church? No, I think that's what folks think that Israel is, or folks think that Israel is better than the church. No, the Bible doesn't even hold out that Israel is better than the church. Nowhere in the Bible does it state that Israel is better than the church or even, or does the Bible even say that the church, that Israel is better off than the church. Nothing is better than the church and nothing or no one is better off than the church. The church is where you want to be. It's almost like saying, well, listen, I made all district um, as a backup punter versus this kid over here made All-American. I, I, I think the All-American is better versus the All-District. We think that All-District Israel is better than All-American Church. The church is greater than Israel. Are you with me? God is just putting on full display what he's going to do with Israel. Oh, by the way, what Israel is going through right now, the fact that their back has been turned, has turned on God, that was prophesied. That was prophesied. God is getting ready to do a number on Israel. Some Gentiles are going to come through as well, but it's for the benefit of Israel because of their disbelief, their hard-headedness, their harlotry. By the way, guys, thank you for the super chat. Um, I'll, I'll come Revelation. I'll, I'll come to that in just a little bit, uh, Jeff, as well, and I'll come to some of your questions also towards the end. But there is a distinction. A Jew or Gentile can be part of the church, but only Jews can be part of Israel. That's not like you, you, you're not, again, you're not missing out on anything. I think people need to get that. You are not missing out on anything because you are not Israel. All right. Now, this issue of replacement theology, or they would say expansion theology or fulfillment theology, whatever, it's, it's all wrong. You do not take the place of Israel, but let's listen to someone else say so. I'm, I'm going to look and I'm going to say that, um, that the church is true Israel. So uh, whereas I would say, no, the church has replaced Israel. Replacement theology, just for the record, is is really a derogatory term that, that right. dispensationalists came up with. Because we would say, you know, start with... Now, notice what he says. He says the church has replaced Israel, but replacement theology is a derogatory term. You literally just said what you call it. You just said it, and you said it was a derogatory term. Well, then why do you keep saying the church replaces Israel? So you can't get mad when someone says, when someone says that uh, replace, brings up replacement theology. You can't say that and say it's a bad thing when you literally out of your mouth says, say that the church has replaced Israel. But the question is going to be again, which by the way, you've never seen them do. You've never seen them give the passage. Now, let me ask you guys, and I don't, I don't know if, if I saw, did anyone in moderators help me out? Did anyone, when I asked, is there a verse that says that, says that the church has replaced Israel? Is there a verse that anyone put up to state that the church has replaced Israel? Has has, has anyone has anyone put it? Now I'm, I'm not sure because I was I was kind of moving around, but um, I don't know if anyone did that. Uh, let me someone let me go to Acts 7:38. Someone put Acts 7:38. So let me just go there and look real quick. I'm not sure if it is or isn't, but if it is, we'll deal with it. If it's not, then I have to I'll have to ignore it. Okay, you're saying, okay, you're saying that this is, let's go to it then. Let's pull up this passage. Someone said, one, two, three, four. Who was this? This person said that, uh, four ALC says that this is a passage that says the church has replaced Israel. So let's go to uh, Acts 7, 38. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who sits with our fathers 
and he received living oracles to pass on to you. Uh, no. With all due respect, brother, that's, that's, no, that, that's not, no. No. Um, he's speaking of what Moses is doing, but this is not, this is not saying the church has replaced Israel. And again, there's no reason why the church, think about it. Israel wants, God wants Israel to be part of the church. Y'all do recall this passage. Let me put it on the screen. John 10, 16. John 10, 16. He says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. Now, Jesus is there speaking to who? To these Jews, telling them that if you're my sheep, you'd be following me. My sheep follow me. He's speaking to these Jews, and at this point, we're really speaking of these Jewish sheep. But here he says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And look what he says, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. So all these people, so the Jews and the Gentiles, all these sheep will be brought together to become one flock. So how, and, and by the way, this gigantic group, this gigantic group of Gentiles. What's their story? Think about it. Well, what's their story? Think about the, if there were, if the Bible were to highlight the North Koreans who are in Christ. Could you imagine what, what, what heaven has, has, has spoken about them? Because you do believe that, you'd have to believe that heaven was involved, Right? Some way, shape, or fashion, God was involved in every last persecuted North Korean Christian. And then we would look at their story. And if we were to peel back the layers and just to see how God has protected them, kept them, kept them strong. You know, it takes, a, I would imagine it takes an awful lot of Holy Spirit in you to really, really want to be saved in North Korea. Yeah, it, it would take a lot. Or, or, or what about a place like China, certain parts of China? What about certain parts of Africa? So, yeah, clearly God is working in you. What, what, what is the angelic activity in those Christians who will take a bullet for the gospel? We don't hear their story. And because we don't hear their story, but we hear mainly the Jewish story, we think that's the greatest story ever. No, no, God has just given us the, the detail of, 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 of Israel. And why did he say, so I'm taking this small, insignificant group of people. They are the least of people, as God says, not because it's something special, something great. They are the least of people, but God is trying to show what he can do with the least of people who aren't very obedient, by the way, what can he do with them? So what will he do with others? He hadn't told, it's not chronicled for us in the Bible, uh, what's happening to the, to the Christians who are in Syria. It's not chronicled in the Bible what happened to the Christians who are in Yemen. It's not chronicled in the Bible with the Christians who are in Russia. We do think that that the, the Bible chronicles American Christians. We we do think that though for some reason. Well, I know why because again we have an inflated view of ourselves. All right, but we just have a chronicling of what God has done with Israel. But it doesn't mean that He's not doing anything with us. And because we we've got promises that He made specifically with Israel, does not mean that He had made promises. For us now, that being the case, uh, listen to what else Joel says, and this is the problem. Uh, if you want to find, if you were to go to a doctor's office and the doctor would say, "Yep, there's a problem right there. Here's the diagnosis," Joel is getting ready to let us know what the issue is. But it's not. But guys, it's not just him. Part with the New Testament, that's you know shedding light on the Old Testament. They're, they're not. They're not pitted against one another. There's a perfect, right. a perfect, you know, unity to the Old and the New Testament. But I can't remember th what theologian it was, but he said the Old Testament is like a richly furnished room, uh, mm -hmm. but but the lighting is dim. And yeah. Christ, especially in the apostolic writings, is the light that that yeah. you know reveals the richness of this room. And so we we would look at the New Testament in order to understand more fully the promises and the messianic prophecies. So we look at the New Testament to share light on the Old Testament. We look at the New Testament to understand the Old Testament. That's problematic. That's very problematic. Why is that? Well, first of all, I think we ought to understand, or we ought to at least contact God. 
we we should contact God and said, God, you, you you got that you got that in reverse. You did it backwards. You should have put Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the beginning. The gospels go first, and then let's let's move Genesis and let's put uh Malachi and Obadiah. Let's put those towards the back. We don't read them that much anyway. No. You miss what God is doing. You miss the character of God. You miss the nature of God. You miss what God is after. You miss God on full display in the Old Testament. We think, and that's the problem. Well, I, I don't know much about Jewish law and, the, and Jewish history and so forth. And eh, so, but this stuff right here, yeah. I grew up with a cross in the house. I go to a church. Yeah, so I, I get that. No, you do not read the New Testament. You don't understand the New Testament. I mean, the Old Testament in light of the New Testament, you understand the New Testament in light of the Old Testament. We are building on something. We start from Genesis. We see what God is trying to do. Does God do what he means to do? What he says he's going to do? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. That's why I say, I gave an example about the father, well, the son getting ready to get married. The son has his bride chosen. The father's going to determine when this is going to happen. In the meantime, what is the father doing? I mean, what is the son doing? The son is going to his father's house, either in the actual house itself or on the land. And what is he doing? He's building on to his father's house. That's why when Jesus makes a statement, in my father's house, there are many mansions or many dwellings. Where does that come from? Well, Joel, anyone else? That comes from an understanding of the Old Testament. We said before, when we read any prophecies regarding Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, when we see it, yeah, it does bring up Jesus, but what is that prophecy for? It's for the Jews as they look back to what happened to the to the, to the uh, suffering servant. But if we don't read Isaiah 53, then we don't get it. So no, they go together. Matter of fact, I would say this. I wouldn't, I wouldn't break up the Bible. I wouldn't, this Old Testament, New Testament, this is, no, I wouldn't do that. This is just because God hadn't changed. We just see this continuation of what God is doing. God is unfolding things through us. Matter of fact, there are things that unfold further in the New Testament than earlier in the New Testament. There's some things we didn't know about in the first part of the New Testament that we'll find out even more so in the latter part of the New Testament. Are you with me? So we don't read the New Testament to, to turn around and shed light on the Old Testament. Now, are some things brought, made a little bit clearer in some cases? Sure. We don't know fully what's happening when when God says, when he has them lined up in the garden in Genesis 3, and he says that to the woman, the seed, your, your seed will, will crush his the seed of the serpent's head. We don't fully understand that. We see it played out. But there's some other things that we also see that we miss in the new if we don't understand it in the old. They work together. None, neither the old, the old Testament is not greater than the new. The new is not greater than the old. The old doesn't shed light on the, on the new and the new sheds light on the old. They both work together. This story that we have is given to us by God, not just so that we can understand one part of it, but the whole of it. Why, God didn't just waste his time and just wrote something, have, have it written down just because I've got some paper and some ink. Let me go ahead and kill it. No, that's not what he's doing. It's not what he's doing. And so therein lies the problem. But I want to go ahead and, 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 and cut to the chase. Who Israel is, and I'll make this point. I'll, I'll tell you who it is, and then I'll, make, I'll go to the scriptures. Israel is not, I asked the question, is the church, is that Israel? No. Anyone with Jewish blood or ethnic? No, that's not Israel. That's not the true Israel. Uh, those who are in Israel now, no. I said I didn't give you the actual answer. The actual answer is anyone who is, it's a combination of answer number one and answer number two. Any ethnic Jew who places their faith in Christ is the true Israel. Being ethnic in of itself doesn't do anything for you. Are you with me? Anyone who places their faith in Christ doesn't become a Jew. So when people bring up Romans 9, Romans 9 is not speaking about Gentiles. He's speaking about Jews. How do I know what? We'll go to Romans in, in, in a second. But remember what God is doing, what God said he's going to do. Do y'all remember when God makes a statement about Israel and their treachery and their cheating? They made God jealous. So what did God say? In 
Deuteronomy 32. Now remember, God is getting ready to put them, take them into the promised land. Think about this. They're getting ready to go into the promised land and God has already told them, I'm going to put you out of the promised land. Why? Because you're, because you're not good people. You are, you're playing the harlotry. You're playing harlotry as well. You are cheating on me. You've made me jealous. And so what is God's response to Israel making him jealous? Going after other gods and idols. What does he say? Chapter 30, 32, verse 21 of Deuteronomy, he says, they have made me jealous with what is not God. That, that are, that's Jews, Israel. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. Look what look at look at God's promise. Look what God says He's going to do. So I, God, will make them who's the them Israel. These Jews, I'll make them jealous with those who are not a people. Who's that? Us. He's going to make the Jews jealous with us. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. And this word nation, uh, goy, which is just people. And so with us. Hosea says the same thing. Matter of fact, it's reiterated in Romans as well as Acts. I'm going to choose these people to make Israel jealous. Why would he have to make Israel jealous if God doesn't have any concern for Israel? He does have a concern for Israel. Why? Because they're great? Because they're special? No, because God on his own initiative, on his own accord, made a covenant with Abraham, reiterated with Isaac and Jacob, and then also calls it out again with Moses. Not because you guys are wonderful, but because I will remember the promise that I had with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's it. And so because of this jealousy that they're going to provoke God to, then he is going to bring in or start utilizing these other people who are not Jews. Well, how's he going to do that? Well, first things first, we've got to get rid of these people out of the land. Remember the land that Vody and others said that the land is not that important. That land is important. Remember, God tells them they have to have a Sabbath on the land. That land is important to God. God values that land. If it's important to God, it should be important to us. Certainly important to, to, uh, to Israel. He says in Leviticus, let's go to 30, 26, 33. Remember, they have to have a seven-year Sabbath. Every seventh year, the land is to take a break, a rest. Every seventh year. What does Israel not do? <laughs> what God tells them to do. Well, matter of fact, it's a trivia, piece of trivia. What does Israel not do? The same as us, <laughs> what, whatever God told us to do. They don't do what God tells them to do. They're, they even more so. Tells them to have this seven-year Sabbath. They don't do it. And so look what he says in chapter 26 of Leviticus, verse 33. You, however, I will scatter among the nations. Wait a minute. Nations, that's, that's Gentiles. And I will draw out a sword after you as your land becomes desolate and your cities become waste. Then the land will enjoy, enjoy its Sabbath all the days of desolation while you, who's the you? The you is Jews. So then I will enjoy, the land will enjoy its Sabbath while you Jews are in your enemies, the Gentiles land. Then, then the land will rest and enjoy Sabbath. Now, I won't finish reading this. Question guys, how many how many violations occurred? How many times did Israel disobey the seven-year Sabbath? How many times did Israel disobey this seven? And I'm using this word seven for a reason. Every seven years of this seven, how many times did Israel disobey it? They dis... Right, Stephen, Stevie, 70 times. They violated this 70 times. So every seven years... There's supposed to be a, there's supposed to be a Sabbath and y'all did it 70, 70 times. So 70 times seven, that's a number y'all to keep in mind. 70 times seven, that's what Daniel receives when he's praying. Hey, it's almost time for us because now they're put out of the land. The first time they're put out of the land, coming back in after the first 70 years. Daniel, hey, I can count. What's up, God? He prays. The angel comes, and so Daniel is literally praying about his people, Israel. That's why I don't know what Vody is thinking when he says that his people is speaking about God's people. No, he's speaking about Israel. We know he's speaking about Israel and not God's people because God also says what he's going to do with those very same people. It could not be. Matter of fact, I didn't mean, let's, let's do this. 
doggone it, and got me, got me going. Let's go to, to uh, Daniel 9. And I think we'll start in 24. Daniel 9. Let's see if the his people that he's speaking of are God's people. He says, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people. This is now who's your people? I say that your people are Israel and not God's people. Why? Because he could have literally said um, God's people, but he says, your people. Amka, which is your people. Am is your, and then the I mean, I'm his people, and then ka is the pronominal suffix that is for your. So your people. He could have said his people, God's people. He could have easily said that, but he didn't. But for your people and your holy city, the city, yeah. So what city are we speaking of? Not Washington, D.C., not Dallas, not Chicago, not Philly, Jerusalem. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sin. Well, he clearly isn't talking about God's people, is he? to make atonement for the iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there will be 70, there will be seven weeks. Now I won't go to any, any of all of that. There's no way that you can read this and think that he's speaking about all of God's people. He's speaking of Israel specifically. We're going to make this even more so be known because he goes to, to Romans 9. So we'll deal with that in a second. And so because of their treachery, because of their sin, they were put out of the land for 70 years. It's coming up. Hey, Daniel. Daniel's praying. What's up, God? And so what's the decree? 77s. Why 77s? Oh, never mind, God. I don't have to ask. I was going to ask. God, I was going to ask why 77s, but never mind. I realized we, we disobeyed that Sabbath 70, 70 times. So 77s are going to be decreed. The first 69, there is no church. The last seven, that's me. Uh, there is no church also. Why? Because he's going to deal with Israel. How do I know? Well, let's go to what he says about, where is it at? Where is it? Where is it at? Uh, about Israel having this trouble, better known as Jacob's trouble. He says, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write all the words which I have spoken to you in books for behold, days are coming, declares the Lord. Look what he says. When I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel, he says, which people, my people, Israel and Judah. So we know he's speaking about this ethnic group because Israel and Judah, that's the north and the south. When I'll restore them, the Lord says, I will bring them back to the land that I gave their forefathers and they shall possess it. If he's speaking about all of us, the church, if these are Daniel's people or in this case, Jeremiah's people, what land, what land are we, what land are we being brought back to? So it, it, it clearly is not us. It clearly is not us. And he says, verse seven, alas, for that great day, there is none like it. And it and it is the time of Jacob or Israel's distress, but he will be saved from it. Who will be saved from it? Jacob's people or Jacob or Israel. Now, I want to go to Romans nine because this is the part that bothers me. This is the part that bothers me because we bring this up in regards to Israel. So you all tell me, Paul is, by the matter of fact, again, I'm not a dispensationalist. I have a dispensational hermeneutic. Romans happens to be one of the most dispensational books <laughs> in the Bible. And so folks who are against dispensationalism, I don't care if you are or not, but it tends to be a lot of those who are Calvinists, which I, again, love Calvinists, I've been accused of being a Calvinist. So I don't have a problem with Calvinists. But you read Romans 9, 10, 11 as though it's all about election, missing that, no, guys, you reform folks, this is why you can't be reformed because this is speaking about Israel. Paul is speaking about salvation. We've been told, and it, Romans, wonderful book, been told that there's nothing that can separate us. Matter of fact, early on, he said, he said, he said, God said through Paul that, well, what's the difference? What's the point in even being Jewish? What's the point in being? Because he said, there's really no difference. There really is no difference. I don't know why you all are tripping off of, are getting all excited and bothered by there being Israel and there being not Israel, there being the church and there being, why are you bothered? There, there is no difference. But then he makes a statement. He says, well, what's the, what's the point? Is there any benefit in being Israel? Well, yeah, 
they were the ones that were initially given the oracles of God. And who who preached the gospel first? The Jews did. Who's who is who is going to have the gospel preached to them? The Jews. By who? By the Gentiles. We are going to serve this new covenant. We're going to be ministers of this new covenant in that regard. Now and even into, even into, um, I think, even the tribulation. I won't get on that just yet. But so now we get to Romans 8, speaking about how salvation is secure and so forth. Romans 9, there seems to be a bit of a switch. Romans 9, he says this. You all tell me, do you think he's speaking about a physical Israel or a spiritual Israel? Here's what he's saying. I'm telling you the truth. This is Paul in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have a great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated for, from Christ for the sake of my brethren. Which brethren do you all think that Paul is speaking of? Do you think he's speaking of literal ethnic brethren or spiritual brethren? He says, he makes it clear, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Oh, so you are talking about ethnic people who are Israelites. Oh, so Paul here is speaking of ethnic Jews, ethnic Israel, not a spiritualized Israel, not the church. We're going to see that in a second, because if you think he's talking about the church, well, then Houston and Jerusalem, we got a problem. He says, who are Israelites to whom belong the adoptions of sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promise. Well, that's, that's Israel, guys. Uh, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ? That's Israel, according to the flesh, who is over all. God bless forever. Amen. So, do you all, does anyone, is there anyone that thinks that Israel in Romans 9, at least thus far, is not the physical Israel, is not the actual Israel? Or do you think that the, he's speaking of a spiritualized Israel? Uh, do you think he's speaking about the church? Well, look what he says, because Paul is bothered because at this point, Jews are not coming in droves to Christ. We're going to find out why. We've covered this before. He says, but it's not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. This is where it gets goofy from you Christian folk. I'm, I'm blaming you Christian folk on this one. We read this passage. Well, it's not, not all Israel is Israel. So that means that Gentiles can become Israel. How do you read that? How do you take this passage to say that not all Israel's Israel, but some Gentiles are Israel? No. He's speaking about now about Israel. Which Israel? The physical Israel. And his point is not all of those physical Jews, physical Israelites, are actual Israel. But what do you mean, Paul? Glad you asked. Nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac, your descendants will be named. Now, Vody brings this up and he says, see, this is showing that anybody just through faith. No, that's not that's not his point. His point here is that because you are of a physical lineage doesn't mean that you are actually of Israel. Being part of the physical lineage isn't enough. That's the first step to be part of Israel. The second step is that you have faith. Why? Because what has God promised he's going to do? He's going to bring Israel back to the fold or bring them into the fold. Some Jews have made it in. Some Jews are believing Jews. Without question, the first believers were Jewish. He says, that is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. Descendants. The word here is sperma. The descendants he's speaking of, the actual descendants are those, those physical descendants who also have faith. Now, does that mean that us Gentiles who have faith are not part of this, this great, wonderful church? No, it does not mean that. He's not, Paul at this moment is not talking about us. He's taking a break to talk about what's bothering him, that is Jews aren't coming to, the, to faith. He says, at this time, look what he says, at this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son, and not only this, but there was Rebecca also when she conceived twins, by one man, our father Isaac, for the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad so that God's purpose, according to his election or choice, would, would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. What's the point that Paul is making? Paul is saying that the same reason that you folks made it in, especially, especially you 
Calvinist folks, I agree with you on this, that God has, through his, through his redemptive work, has chosen. So how is it that he has chosen you, but he cannot have cho chosen the Jews? That's his point. As a matter of fact, he's going to drive that point home a little bit. Verse 14, what shall we say then? There, there is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy on, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion on. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Now, this can be applied to everybody. Just know that, hey, listen, you ain't the one that's doing the heavy lifting. You can will all you want. If God don't, then it don't matter. God shows mercy and compassion on whom he wants to. Someone says, Corey, you are not a Gentile. What am I, since you know my medical records? Bruce says, I am not a Gentile. I wonder, how do you know that? How do you know that? <laughs> anyway, for the purpose, I'm sorry, let, let me drop down a little bit. Let's go to, uh, where was the pastor? There was a pastor that I, that I highlighted that I wanted to go to. Yeah, I want to go to verse 24, that area. Look, notice what he says here in verse 24. He says, even us, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. So there is a distinction between Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles. He's always in the scriptures made a distinction between Jews and Gentiles. That's not a new thing. And so, it, and it's not a thing that we need to fight over. It's clearly in the scripture. He says, and we, we covered this passage before, but he reiterates it in Hosea and he reiterates it here. Quoting Hosea, he says, as he also says in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. Who's he speaking of? Who are those that are, that are called that were not his people that will be called to be his people? Gentiles. Who is that that's not beloved that we will call beloved? Gentiles. Why is he doing so? We read it earlier because here he says that I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. He's going to make Israel jealous with those who are not a people. That's the point, guys. And so he says, I'm not going to get too bothered because what God said he's going to do with Israel, he is going to do with Israel. Look what he says. It shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah cries out. Who does? Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. I thought that he would. This isn't about the national Israel. This is not about ethnic Israel. Well, Paul says Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Through the number of the sons of Israel, though the number of sons of Israel be like sand of the sea, uh, it is the remnant that will be saved. A remnant of who? A remnant of Israel. Israel. Are you with me? For, verse 28, for the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. So he's going to choose Jews out of them to be saved. And just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of Sabbath had left to us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. In other words, are there going to be some Jews that will be saved? Yes, that's what the posterity is. Some, some other Jews, some descendants there's going to be a posterity that's going to be saved. Verse 30, what shall we say then? That Gentiles, making a distinction, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, they got it, and us Jews don't? No, look, he says, even the righteousness which is by faith, but Israel pursuing a law of righteousness, they didn't get it. Why? Because, verse 32, they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it was by worth. They thought that, hey, just because I'm a Jew, I'm good. No, sir. That's Paul's point. Being a Jew, that's not it. Are there promises made to Israel? Yeah, but they're going to be the faithful part of Israel that God is going to redeem. Who are those faithful in Israel? We don't know. Just as is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Now, where is this passage from? This is from Isaiah. Paul does a lot in Isaiah. What's interesting about Isaiah, Isaiah, especially 53, we talked about it, Isaiah 53 gives this prophecy of the Jews looking back on their Messiah, who they turned their back on. Where is Israel's state right now? Their backs are turned on Messiah. At some point in time, that's at this time of Jacob, they're going to look back. Oh, that's what that prophecy was about. Yeah, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was, that's why it says past tense, was laid upon him. He did bear or bore past tense, our griefs, our sin. And so going to verse 10, he says, my brethren or brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer for God to God for them is their salvation. Who is them and who is there? 
the them and there in this case is Israel. For I testify about them that I have a zeal that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. That that can't be the church, guys. That can't be the church. This is for Israel. For not, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. So now, here's the point. If you think, and I want to jump down to a passage, that if you think this is regarding uh, spiritual Israel, we got a problem. We have a problem. Um, let's see. Let's drop to... 24 of chapter 11 because I don't want to I don't want too much to labor this point no 25 he says for I do not want you brethren to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in here's the question this is how we know who is Israel and who is not this is how we know that <laughs> the Hebrew Israelites are not, are not Israel. If you are actual Israel right now, if you are a true Jew, a true Israel that Paul is speaking of right now, actual Israel, what does he say? There's a partial hardening that has come. The partial hardening is on who? The spiritual church, the church, or on Israel? Well, it can't be the church because if it's on the church, they wouldn't be the church. It's on Israel. Spiritual Israel? No. Physical. Ethnic Israel. Ethnic Israel, there is a, and here comes someone, the Israelites are black. Whatever. Listen, guys, let me just say this, because I don't think you guys, some, some people just aren't listening. I could care less if the Israel were black or white or red. It doesn't matter. Guess what Paul just said in the Bible? So, mister, I would, I would invite you to pay attention to the scriptures. Stop following these fools on the corner. And I call them fools on the corner because that's what they're doing. And they're leading you away. Because you're deceived does not mean that you get away with it. There are those that are deceiving and those that are deceived. But now, Joshua, you want to be part of the, the Israelites? Fine. Did you read what he said? Let me put back on the screen again. He says, a partial hardening has come to me. You do realize that Israel has been giving a spirit of stupor. So, all you black folks wanting to run to be Israelites, fine. That's probably why. That's probably why a spirit of stupor is put over you. This hardening of your heart to where you can't even see the word clearly. You can't even see or hear the word clearly. He says, a partial hardening has come. How long has the partial hardening come? How long will this partial hardening be? Until the fullness of the Gentiles. Well, who are the Gentiles? I thought the church, us Gentile church, was is well it can't it can't be we this passage eliminates this this should deal with any idea that the church is it here listen listen see what he did he goes to Deuteronomy 28 that's fine brother that listen read all of read all of Deuteronomy don't just read Deuteronomy 28 read read 10 read chapter 30 you guys and this is the problem the biggest problem on the planet amongst those who call themselves followers of God. Whether they be just traditional Christians, Protestants, Baptist, Methodist, whether you're Presbyterian, Southern Baptist, whatever, whether you're Catholic, whether you're Mormon, whether you're Jehovah's Witness, I'm going to the cults too now, whether you are Hebrew Israelite, IUIC or, or any other ones. Well, whatever you are, the biggest problem with everybody is that we're not reading our Bible. We're taking bits and 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 putting together. That's why you can see this guy saying that Job's skin was black. Why don't these Hebrew Israelites learn Hebrew? I mean, real Hebrew. Why don't you learn Hebrew? Because if you did, you'd find that his skin had become black which meant I guess it wasn't black before. I don't know. If, if, if you want to say that, Pentecostals too, Cameron. <laughs> the problem is we're not reading. It's not just them. It's even the folks that we love. Love Vodibaka. But you have put the church in the place of Israel. And according to this passage, tell me. Now, if there are those, and I'm, I imagine there's probably some, some, those, some of those that are, dis that are disagreeing over 600 folks here. So somebody tell me. 
Someone tell me. According to this passage, verse 25, is it possible that Israel, that the church can be Israel? Because if it does, who is the hardening come over? There is no way. His point is there's promises that are that have been made to Israel. There are promises that have been made to Israel. Remember what Paul says. He says that the gifts and calling are irrevocable. He says that in chapter 11. So since these gifts and calling are irrevocable, that means that God's promises to Israel will be carried out. His promises to Israel will be carried out. Does that mean that the, the promises to us that we have won't be? No, that has nothing to do with us. Let me see what he says. Hardening was only on partial. Uh, there have always been many hearing the gospel and turning from the way they were to Jesus. There's always been Jews. That's, that's Paul's point. Paul actually covers that point and says that there are Jews who have come. He says, I myself am a Jew. But Paul's point is that Israel, by and large, is not coming. And that this hardening, this hardening, this spirit of stupor, it's not a full hardening because if that were the case, then no Jews would be coming. So there's a part, there's a partial hardening. There are going to be some Jews that are coming. There are going to be some Jews who have been hardened, who at the time where it's time for them to hear, they'll remember a Jew who was not hardened, who, hey, why are these, these Messianic Jews, for example? Hey, Bob, who is Jewish, who is worshiping the, Jesus as Messiah, what gives? Oh, now I get, I see why now. And so this partial hardening has happened. How long will the partial hardening be? Until the fullness of the Gentiles. When will the fullness of the Gentiles end? We don't know. That Randy, you said it. Hardening is not a good thing. He said he's going to do it, and there's four reasons. Why? Why is he hardening the hearts partially? Why is there a partial hardening over Israel? Why? Because he's dealing with the Gentiles. Why is he dealing with the Gentiles? Because he's making the Jews jealous. Why is he making Israel, the Jews, jealous? Because they provoked him to jealousy. Why did they do that? Because, or how did they do that? They were playing or going with other gods. Well, fine. You chose another god. I'll choose another people. And then see how you like that. So, it's not that difficult. And it's not a reason for us to be bothered. It is not a reason for us to be bothered, guys. The promises of God that he has for us will be carried out. The promises he has for Israel whenever they're carried out, however they're carried out, will be carried out for Israel. He can make, I can make a promise to one daughter and then make another promise to another daughter. I can make a promise to one guy and then make another promise to another person. Because I made a promise to Frank, doesn't mean that Joe needs to stick his lip out. Well, what about me? Because that's kind of what we're doing. I made you a promise, Joe. I made a promise to Bob and to Joe. Y'all remember when, <laughs> when Peter was standing before Jesus and he looks at John? Well, what about him? And Jesus says, what if, what is it to you? What if I what if I decide that he should remain until I come back? What does that have to do with you? Do what you're supposed to do. We don't that's that's our big problem. We're worried about everybody else. I want to be, I want to be Israel. I want to be a Jew. Have you looked at the, the Hebrew Israelite leaders? What in them inspires anything of that that what about them inspires theology? <laughs> what about them inspires Bible knowledge? What about them inspires godly living other than nothing? Well, Corey, you're being a little harsh on them. Yep, so. <laughs> yep, and so. Uh, J.D. Ass says, please touch on Matthew 21, 43. I will do so. I am reformed, but willing to hear you. Matthew 21, 43. Where is that at? Matthew 21, Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken into pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like the dust. That is actually proving my point. Remember, Paul in, in Romans speaks about this, this stumbling stone, this, 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 this stone, this rock of offense. And what does it do? It's going to hit the Jews and move them, bothers them. And so the kingdom has been taken away from you, given to them but not totally, not forever. And so that's what's happening here. He's speaking to these Jews and like, you guys aren't listening. You guys don't hear it. It's almost like you guys don't hear it. It's almost like you Jews having ears don't hear, having eyes don't see. Oh, 
That's actually what he says. So, uh, Jeff says, are you asking me to read Revelation 21, Jeff? I'll go to Revelation 21. Revelation. Now, can I say something? Because someone said that a little bantering back and forth between the dispensationalists and the Reformed people, covenant theologians. And there was one shot that those who hold to Israel being replaced cannot deny. They cannot deny. I'm not saying the genesis of this started at this point, but where it saw its ugliest head was at the time of the Holocaust. Say what you want to say. That's not, that's not a fair, it is a fair shot because it's true. A lot of people were able, a lot of people were able to deal with or to allow what was happening to them at that time. Hey, these Jews, they're the ones that killed the Messiah. They, cru they crucified Jesus. Uh, they're not Christians. Us, us good God-fearing Christian, we have replaced them. They don't even, they don't, these Jews, they don't even have a nation. They lost their own nation. That, that was a rallying call, guys, by the way. That was a rallying call. Uh, in step, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate that. He said, great breakdown. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Uh... Okay, listen, you, you're on something else. I don't, what, what, what. Guys, you guys are going to miss heaven, you all that are, sitting, that, that are spending so much time speaking about the color of someone's skin. But y'all realize now, we don't. it's never told to us what color, what skin color that Jews were. They, they, don't, they, they don't highlight that, do they? They don't highlight that. But some of you guys want to highlight... It's like you you focus on the wrong thing. You're worried, as they say, you're worried about the wrong thing. If you're worried about color, then you're missing Christ. What is spiritual Israel? That that is someone saying that the church has replaced Israel. All of the promises that God made for Israel will be fulfilled spiritually in the church, and so the church becomes spiritual Israel. Now I reject that. I believe all the promises that He made for Israel, they'll receive. Doesn't mean that all of those that have ever been called an Israelite or a Jew will receive it. No, not all Jews will, 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 will receive the benefit. Nope. I'm going to give an answer that I know he won't, won't accept, but uh, they come from out of this lineage of Abraham, who his father's lineage is Abra, which we'll get the term Hebrew. Mos Moses uh, is called a Hebrew. Through this lineage, we have these 12 tribes, ultimately, these 12 tribes. When you have the separation with Judah in the south and Israel, the northern kingdom, during the um, exile and as invaders came into the north and as they hooked up with foreign gods and so forth, and they began to take advantage of them, and then they they got conquered, and then they, they began to be exiled, a lot of the Jews in the northern kingdom moved down to Judah, the southern kingdom. And so Judah became synonymous with Jew. That's that's literally where it, where it came from. And so when you say Jew, when you speak of Israel, when you speak of Hebrew, you're literally speaking of the same thing. So, Will converts of Judaism take on those promises? There's been conversations uh, all throughout Israel's history. You mean, you mean the promises of, Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. If a person uh, converts to Judaism, will they be in the promises that God has for Israel? I'd say no, because the person that did that is really literally going backwards. Again, the whole point of speaking about the difference between Israel and the church is not to highlight the superiority of Israel. And I think people get that get that misunderstood. We're not highlighting Israel as some beacon beacon of, hey, let's be like them. No, let's not be like them. Let's not be like them. The church is in a far superior position than Israel. Israel, just being Israel, does not make you saved. But being saved makes you part of the church. So clearly one is more favorable than the other. And so if a person decides, you know what, I want to convert to Judaism. Okay. God clearly isn't going to, the promises for Israel are for ethnic Israel. So you converting doesn't do anything for you. Matter of fact, you, again, you're going backwards. We're going that away. 
and you're going over there. You put your car in reverse and go back the other way. So no. Yep, that's it. They, as Paul says, they stumble, but but not fall. Their fall is not complete. You say under, <laughs> according to the Stroms, um, speaking about the color. Well, first of all, strong Strongs is not gospel. Um, Strongs is very helpful. But let me ask you all a question. Do y'all think when when Noah had his three boys, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Do you think that that they had three different ethnic babies? Look, baby, I got a white kid. Look, baby, I got a Jewish kid. Look, baby, I got a black kid. No, that's not what happened. But as you move again, you are going to the hue, the color of your skin. Listen, when I was up north, I was a little bit lighter. Down here in the south, I'm a little bit darker. <laughs> just how it is. I told you guys my father thought I was a little yellow baby. Why? That's just kind of how the sun is up north. This is how it is. So, uh, thank you, Jeff. You said, uh, oh, okay. Jeff says, Revelation 21, 21 to 26, 22 to 26, I'm sorry, um, to your points that Israel is Israel and other nations, Gentiles will come to them. And, and by the way, guys, there are going to be some Gentiles. I'll, I'll elaborate on this even more. I've done it in the past, but there are going to be some Gentiles who I believe I have a pre-tribulation rapture view. There are going to be some Gentiles who, man, I thought I was saved. Okay, well, you're not. But they know the Word of God. There will be a lot of folks who know the Word of God who's going to miss it. And so they, <laughs> Robin, they are going, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, they are, are going to also participate in one, themselves coming to Christ, and then speaking to these to these Jews as well. They they're gonna be some Gentiles that are gonna be saved through this time as well. Thank you, Alfred Young. I appreciate the super chat. Uh, but now, by the way, I'm not poo-pooing on strong concordance. I'm not. Strong concordance is very helpful. Uh, but but uh did they move to different regions? Well, sure they did. People people migrated different regions all the time. Corey, are you reading these questions and statements? Am I reading these questions and statements? No, I'm not. Yes, I am. I'm reading as many as I can. I'm reading as many as I can. It's, it's, it's kind of hard. There's there's a bunch moving. Sometimes this thing just zooms. So. Uh, Brian, I won't go over that. Just go over my last couple of videos over, over the rapture. Um, that's another two hours to hash it out. I won't, I won't cover that. So, uh, you're right. God is not a respecter of persons. And I think people think that when, when I bring up this issue, the distinction between Israel and the church, that is say, to say that God is respecting uh, different. He's not. He's not. He was using these people to bring about the gospel or to show himself. But not that they were any better than him. Because remember, do y'all do realize, y'all do realize that anybody, even when God was working or dealing with Israel, that anybody be it a Jebusite, a Hittite, a Canaanite, anyone could have found themselves in the camp of Israel. Anyone could have. But what did they do when they saw the hand of the Lord moving with Israel? They wanted to fight and rebel rather than doing what Rahab did and joining. They didn't want to, they could have. These were wicked, evil people. Rather than falling in love with God and just seeing his awe, being in awe of him, they didn't do that. They still wanted to fight. That's why God said to utterly destroy them. These were wicked people. These were people, had they been born years earlier, they would have not made it through the flood. But because of his promise not to destroy the world with the flood, all right, fine. I'll, 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 let, this, I'll let this last. But these are folks who, just wicked people. But they could have done what Rahab did or what others did. There, remember, when they came out, there were other foreigners, sojourners that were with them. They could have done so. And so it's not that he's respecting anyone. He's just using them as a tool. He's using Israel as a tool. Not And God has never said that Israel, God has never said that Israel was better. But because he made a promise, he's going to fulfill the promise. Not because of them, but because of the sake of his own word. Are you with me? Juju said, how did you learn Hebrew? It's a real funny story. When I, when I was in prison, I, wanted, I thought about learn, learning one of the languages 
And at the chapel library, we didn't have very much in there, but there happened to be a, a, a Hebrew book, how to, how to read Hebrew. Not the best book, and so that's how I got started. And then by, by just God's providence, an actual Greek scholar comes to the compound who is a chaplain, who, by the way, I had on before and kind of inspired me to start doing Hebrew and Greek at the same time. So my Hebrew is not is nowhere near on par with the Greek because I spend more time in the Greek, which I'm making myself go back and restudy Hebrew right now. So. Christians are going to deal with persecution. We all deal with persecution. Paul says that if anyone desires is in Christ or desires to be in Christ, he shall endure some persecution. Not all of us, the same sort of persecution. But there is this great tribulation that is going to come. And the question I asked was, why? What's the purpose? Well, if you go to the Old Testament, he gives you a lot of detailed account as to why there is going to be a tribulation. He is not coming to have a tribulation to punish Christians, to make them become Christians. No, the tribulation is to turn Jews into Christians, to turn Jews into the church. If you're already in the church, why would I spank you for doing good? Has God ever punished the righteous with the unrighteous? Is that his plan? No, it's not. Say amen. <laughs> uh, Leontine Hudson, thank you so much for the super chat. Am I saying your name right, Leontine? Trina also, thank you for the super sticker. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Can I share what app I'm using? This is, well, I use two apps. I use, uh, this is Concordance. And I also use Lagos. I use Lagos from time to time and I use Concordance. Concordance just shows up better on the screen than, than does Lagos. And so... Somebody, somebody's words got dis, uh, deleted, but I just saw that um, about wrath and tribulation. I've covered wrath and tribulation, different words, but you, but can be used synonymously, and so no need to cover it now. But anyway, uh, but this one, this particular app, or this, this not an app, um, is it? Maybe it is an app. I don't know what an app is. I guess, but this is uh, Accordance Bible software. It just shows up better on the screen. I can move from different different tabs and text easier. Uh, let's see. No, Brian. Caleb was not from the tribe of Judah, uh, but he was adopted into it, so to speak. But he was not. His lineage, his physical lineage, was not the tribe of Judah. Uh, matter of fact, we guys come to the Saturday morning Bible study. We talked about that. How in the world, when God tells Moses, maybe I'll just start over. I'll just start over. I'll, I'll destroy all of these people and start with you. Well, wait a second. You already promised that the, the scepter should not depart Judah. How could that be? And so wait a second. Is, is it because Caleb was kind of adopted into this tribe? Caleb is now because he's got a, there are these 12 tribes. You're with somebody. If you're not physical, by the way, the name Caleb means dog, literally means dog. Uh, interesting to think about. But Caleb is, uh, is it Kenanite? Kenanite? I forgot. Kenanite? Something? What? Kishanite? Kishanite? Whatever. I can't remember what, what he is, but he's not originally Jewish. So, interesting little tidbit. Which another promo come to the Bible study? Are there any tips on how you can study some biblical Greek and Hebrew? Because I'm not in any real ministry school yet. Listen, you don't have to be. All you, go in it and grab you basics of biblical Greek or basics of biblical Hebrew. Greek is easier to learn than Hebrew because when you look at the Greek letterings, a lot of it looks like like the like the alpha in in Greek looks like our A, the kappa in in. And I'm looking right now. The I'm looking at the word chi. The word kappa, the letter kappa, looks like a K. The iota, not iota. Iota looks like an I in English. Uh, Omicron looks like an O. Now, there are some words like the P. It's not pi, it's P. I don't know why we say pi. It's not pi, it's P. Looks nothing like any letter that we have, but it's still better. But we have cognates like the word cardio. Well, we have cardio where we can understand what that means. Or cosmos. Well, we can understand what cosmos is. Hebrew, no. No such thing. It's just, it's just vastly different. It looks like drawing more than anything else. So... 
but you can learn it. it's it's simpler but just looking at it and pronouncing it can be it, it can be a bit cumbersome so anyway <laughs> i'm gonna name my next dog caleb but but then you gotta then you gotta explain to everybody why What channel is the Saturday Morning Bible Study? The Saturday Morning Bible Study is going to be on this channel, Smart Christians Channel. Uh, all right, guys. So, to make a long story short, I'm sorry, to make a short story long, Israel, the true Israel, is not the church. The true Israel are not blacks. The true Israel are not the Jews that are over the land. The true Israel is not anyone who has Jewish blood or who's ethnic Jew. True Israel are ethnic Jews who have placed their faith in Christ. That's where uh, this point comes up with Paul. But being Israel by itself, being a Jew, doesn't do you any good. Doesn't, you, doesn't do you any bit of good. Other, other than saying that you can talk about your great-grandfather who, who, you know, who, who did something, whatever, but doesn't do anything. The church is in a far superior position than Israel. But he is going to take Israel, sum up Israel, and call just like he did with us. And there will be those in Israel who will be saved and they'll be put into the church. The church is made up of Jews and Gentiles. Israel is made up of only Jews. Steve, remind, I'm getting ready to leave. Steve, remind, I'm gonna look that up. I'm gonna look that up. I might, I might have to. <laughs> let me look that. I'm gonna look that up, Stevie. Matter of fact, let me put it right here so I, so I don't forget. Because there's several verses you put up. <laughs> What'd you say? Three. Oh, no, it's just one verse. That's just one verse. I'm look, no, no, there's several verses. Okay, sorry about that. Anyway, guys, uh, yeah, I know Angela. I know she said the answer. The answer wasn't. That's what I said earlier. I said that the, the actual answer was not on the on the poll question. Trick question, then, huh? <laughs> answer guy beats question, please. Ashley says guy beats question. Okay, guy. Oh, you asked me to do something. Okay, fine. I'm going to answer your question um, <laughs> because I, I announced it. This has nothing to do with... Uh... And so the question was, was the church in Laodicea a rebuke? And let's read it. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, amen, the faithful and true witness, in the beginning of uh, the creation of God it says this, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have. It. So yes, is this whole issue about them being a rebuke? Yeah. Um, they seem to be like a lot of Christians. You know what? They seem to be like a lot of American Christians or Western Christians, I would say. Uh, and so yeah, it's it's definitely rebuke. It's definitely rebuke. I mean, getting spewed out that's not that's not a good thing. Now, it also doesn't mean that it, it also does not mean that if you're cold, you're okay. Also, so so anyway, all right, guys, um, love you all, and I will see you. I gotta get some rest. I've gotten like three, maybe six, seven hours of sleep in the last two nights. Because of these doggone wonderful grandkids of mine. Yeah. I'm wore out. You know how you know how wore out I am? I didn't even I didn't even I didn't even drink coffee today for the live stream. I had to go a little stronger. I know it's not healthy. I know it's not healthy. But <laughs> I was struggling. I'm struggling now. I'm struggling now. So anyway. Guys, I love you all, and I will see you tomorrow.